Here's crystal violet. It's only good at very, very acidic things to tell you the difference between something that's crazy acidic and just, oh, all right, terribly acidic. Thymol blue actually has a range that extends where there are two different, oh, this must be one of those cases where you have two different, it must be it must have two H pluses that it can lose. It can lose one down here in this range and another one up here at this range. In between here, even though they've shown this as blank, you'll notice this end is yellow, that end is yellow. It's just yellow all the way through here, okay? So it will go from red to yellow, and then up at the high end, it will go from yellow to deep blue. But we have all these, and they're at different pHs that they operate. Here's phenolphthalein, which is probably the one that most people have seen, where it goes from colorless to a deep red. And you're always trying for the palest pink possible when you're using phenolphthalein because you're like, yes, it just started changing. Because it just started changing, I know what the, what the pH is. Anyway, so many different ones available for you. What do we do with them? Well, we use them in acid-base titrations. And how do you do a titration? Well, first of all, you gotta to put together the apparatus that you're going to use for it. And then here's another wonderful word, accurately. You need to know exactly the amount of the sample that you are working with. Then you put in some of that indicator, or if you're using a pH machine, you'll put in the probe that will give you the numbers. The probe with the numbers, oh, that's nice. It's a probe with numbers. You're never gonna remember anything about it because it's just a nice little thing with numbers on it. This, you'll see the colors change and it makes a much more of an impact on your brain and you'll remember better with indicators. Then you're gonna, you know, the titration apparatus includes a burette. So the burette, will, you will put in the titrant. And it has a known concentration that you're going to use on the analyte. You are analyzing this. This is the sample. You know how much of the sample you put in, but you don't know everything about the sample that you would like. You want to analyze it. You're going to use something you know about and add that to it in order to analyze it. And then it says slowly add the titrant to the sample and monitor the pH change until you get to the equivalence point. What's the equivalence point? When you can see that color change. Then you'll read what the volume was, and you'll be able to go back and calculate the concentration of the analyte because you already knew part of it. Then you knew how you got to equivalence, and that will allow you to do this last calculation. So these titrations generally involve monoprotic acids or monoprotic, mono, yeah, monobasic basic bases. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? Okay, well, I'm sorry. That's just what they decided to call it. It's not the greatest name. Here are a couple of different curves on the same graph, okay? We have, for the blue curve, this is the upper one, okay? and the red curve, what they are. It says for both of them, 20 milliliters. For both of them, the molarity is 0.1 molar. But for the upper one, the blue one, we have a weak acid. For the red one, we have a strong acid, hydrochloric acid. So you can see from this that you will have a different shape of the curve depending on whether you are analyzing something that is strong or weak. This is a curve where you kept adding sodium hydroxide. This was your base. It was the titrant. It was the thing you knew exactly what it was, okay? These are, hey, guess what? This is what you were analyzing. Found it out later, but that's okay. So you have these two curves and you can see that when it is a strong acid and you're adding a strong base, you get a very sort of square thing going on both 
here at the elbow and there at the shoulder. You see how that's an elbow and a shoulder, right? When you have a weak acid, well, there's a couple of little things going on with that. It's not nearly as flat across as this, but if you cut off this initial part here, then it is very flat between here and here. This is the area where it's very flat and includes this midpoint. This is where your Henderson-Hasselbalch equation works extremely well. When would you get to equivalence on these two? Well, equivalence when you're doing the hydrochloric acid, which is strong, and you're using a strong base of sodium hydroxide on it, is exactly at a pH of 7. The equivalence point if you're doing acetic acid, which is a weak acid, and you're using a strong base on it, has the pH raised from the normal. You can see this is about halfway between this and this, between the shoulder and the the elbow, right? So the equivalence point is halfway through. For this, well, halfway through has dropped down a lot farther because this was a lot farther down when you started. So the pH of the HCl is lower than the acetic acid, and you can see the equivalence points are brought down when they are dealing with strong acids, and they're higher for the weak acids. You will also notice this little part here. At the very beginning, the pH changes quite rapidly. Then, in between here and here, it has a gentle, almost linear slope, which corresponds to the Henderson-Hasselbalch area, where you can use that equation very effectively. It's almost a straight line. Henderson-Hasselbalch looks like a straight kind of an equation. PH equals PKA plus the logarithm of something. And it's like, it's a plus, well, it's like, it's like a line, okay? And the pH of the equivalence point is the pH of sodium acetate, which we've covered before. Sodium acetate would be a basic salt because it's made out of a strong base and a weak acid. So the pH of sodium acetate is when you have your equivalence point. And once those acids are neutralized, the pH is controlled by the molarity of the sodium hydroxide. So out here, you see they're both the same. So they put that in purple, blue and red purple.